Welcome to the community of writers in the virtual valley. Um, I am Lisa Alvarez and this year marks my 20th as co-director of the writers workshops um, here um, at the community. And I want to point out that in the audience today is my um, co-director, co um, Louis B. Jones. Um, like our readers, RMC, um, and many in the audience, I first came to the conference as a participant. This event, which welcomes alumni back to celebrate their first books, is always my favorite. This afternoon, I am coming to you from the foothills of Orange County, where I live from the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Tongva peoples. If we were gathering in the valley in Northern California where most of us first met, we would be acknowledging that we were on the unceded territory of the Washoe people. I ask you to consider the history of the land where you are as well and what that history means um, in the present moment we all share. I wanna thank you for joining us today to celebrate the accomplishments of our debut authors. 2020 marks the 50th anniversary of the Community of Writers, and while most of our planned celebrations and events had to be canceled or postponed, we are pleased to have built a footbridge of sorts into a virtual valley where <laughs> events like this reading and other programming continue to bring writers and poets together. Thank you for joining us in our beautiful virtual valley. Jamin Han, our host for the evening, first arrived in the Valley as a participant and then returned to read in this series a couple years ago with her debut novel, A Small Revolution, which among other accolades was named one of Red Book Magazine's 20 books by women you must read this spring, BuzzFeed's six binge-worthy literary books of May, and CNN's Summer Beach Reads. But my favorite is Electric Literature's 10 galvanizing books about political protests. We are delighted to welcome her back as the host of this event. She was born in Seoul, South Korea and grew up in Rhode Island, Ohio and New York. Her nonfiction has appeared in Catapult, Poets and Writers and The Rumpus, among others. She teaches at Sarah Lawrence College and Pace University. And this forthcoming Friday, October 23rd, she will be leading a poetry writing workshop with Demisty Bellinger at, Post, at Pace University's Poetry Festival. It's free and open to the public, and we'll add the link in the chat and our social media feeds so you can join her there if you like. But thank you so much for joining us here this evening. Please welcome Jamin Han. Thank you so much, Lisa and Brett and Louie. And it's so wonderful to see so many faces here. Um, Andrew, who I did a wonderful radio interview with as well. Um, and thank you to the whole community of writers family. It, it's always um, felt like a family to me. It's hard to imagine that Beach Read could also be a book to read before going to a political protest, right? <laughs> Um, 2017 was a surreal year after the election of 2016. Um, a highlight in that turmoil for me was returning to Community of Writers for the alumni reading. As an immigrant, returning to a place is especially meaningful because it's not always guaranteed and because it's almost always changed significantly. At my alumni reading, I was glad to find that this place had not changed in spirit and not at its heart. Anyone associated with community of writers has always been kind, generous, caring, creative in multiple ways, and laid back. I saw writers of all experiences engaged in deep conversations, encouraging each other, talking with and about their workshops, with their leaders and guest speakers and panelists, listening at wonderful events on a diverse range of topics as they walked around the village and the ski lodge. As it turned out, that day was also special to me because I was able to have a reunion with a fellow writer, Brian Rogers, who had been in my workshop with Anne Lamott um, and was also reading at the alumni event. And this is just a shout out to Brian, who's going through some significant health issues right now. So it was just especially meaningful to catch up again there. Um, so thank you to all of you for joining us tonight for the first virtual published alumni reading. 
I wish we could all be at the base of that beautiful, those beautiful mountains right now instead of so far apart. Um, but like those mountains, this community is steadfast and strong. Um, please show your support by going to bookshop.org to order the books by these writers we're going to hear tonight um, or order from your local bookstore. Mine here, Little Joe's, um, will have it curbside for us. And also, um, if you can, donate to support community of writers. You're going to hear tonight from these writers how much scholarships and grants help them. Um, and it also helped me too. Um, back in 95, when I was struggling to pay rent, it helped pay for my flight to California from New York. Um, I was, I, because I want to get to the writers, I, I tried to write some comments quickly to make sure I covered everything. So excuse me for, for looking over here. Um, so we're here to celebrate the power of creativity and the power of the word despite COVID-19 and the effects of climate crisis and the assault on human rights that we're facing from so many fronts. And we've gathered in this format to keep each other safe and to herald the ones who have books out in the world. Um, we're in for quite an inspiring evening with these five writers. I had a chance to speak to each of them and they were just wonderful. Um, and I'm gonna share what we talked about a little bit to break up the monotony of the screen, because I've been on several Zooms and here we are just looking at faces, um, I asked all of them to bring a personal object to kind of hold up. I know we're on multiple screens, but if I could just ask Robin, Shoba, Marcy, Alia, and Kate to hold up the objects that you brought, even for a minute, um, I know there's a great writing prompt about objects, but I thought this was a nice way just to cross the distance between all of us. Great, to Marcy's. Can everyone see? Thank you, Robin. Yes, <laughs> wonderful Shoba. And I don't know how the screens are going. Are you all seeing all of this? Oh, there's Alia. Nice. Beautiful. And I think we have, we have one more. Kate, did you share yours? Thank <laughs> you. So I thought it was a nice way, and, and this is mine. I thought it was just a nice way to kind of bring us into these spaces where we're surrounded by these objects but then can't share. Um, so mine is this little magical bauble. I wear it all the time. Um, I found it in a shop in Seoul um, when I was there for my mother's funeral, and it just so happens, I was so surprised when Brett asked me to do this, that today is her Jessa. Today is the anniversary of her death. And so I was there and got this in a little store, um, and it was this thing was hanging everywhere in this store. And so I had to buy it, um, along with some other things I needed for the funeral. And when I went back to the store before I came back to the States, it had vanished. So I'll leave it at that. Um, it helps me to write. And we're going to be talking about writers tonight. So I wanted to share that with you. Um, and I'm sorry, my daughter, of course, I don't hear from her all day. And right now, she's texting me like crazy. <laughs> so I think that's going to stop in a minute. Um, and she was the one actually who came with me to visit when I went back to the alumni reunion and had a wonderful time. Um, so let's begin. Um, we'd like to ask you to um, turn on your mics in order to applaud after each writer reads and, um, and then turn them off um, so we can listen to them. We love hearing applause. So first up is Robin Page. Robin was raised in Cincinnati and has degrees from UCLA and UC Irvine's MFA program. She lives with her husband and daughter in Los Angeles and has powerfully mined her experience as a displaced Midwesterner, a woman of color, and a mother in her newest book, Small Silent Things. Chin Chang has said of Small Silent Things, in its exploration of political history and familial scars, Small Silent Things covers impressive territory, presenting the murkiness of love beneath the glossy surface of life in Southern California. Robin attended Community of Writers in 2002 with a scholarship from UC Irvine's 
MFA program and worked with Jervie Turvalon. She says that returning to books she loved and rereading them has been her quarantine coping strategy during these pandemic times and keeps her writing. So thank you, Robin. Um, should I just begin, I guess? Uh, the, I, I'll explain this. I am a little bit sentimental, as I think most, um, most writers are. And this was my great uncle's. When he was a kid, he carved this. So I just, I keep it on my desk and I touch it and I think this has been around forever and ever. And I hope to, you know, hand it off to my daughter. But it makes me feel kind of stable and happy um, when I don't feel that way. Um, I'm just going to say a couple of things about the community of writers. When I went to the to the retreat, I was kind of a wide-eyed, excited, um, you know, innocent writer, and I thought that I would be able to find my agent and meet all of these amazing people, and um, and things would go much more quickly for me. And I felt very supported while I was there, just kind of about the work that I was doing, and then. 16 years later or so, when I was finally able to publish my first book, I kept working. I was so happy and grateful, and I'm still so happy and grateful to all of you for continuing to support my work, because that means a lot to me, um, especially, you know, during this time when I think it's pretty hard for debut writers. So I just wanted to say thank you to, to everyone for coming and supporting, and then I'm, I'm just going to read a little bit from my book, which is uh, small silent things I'm going to read from the very beginning, which um, my protagonist's name is Jocelyn. So um, this is from the prologue. Uh, and so Gladys is dead. Wishes in bunk beds or on the number 17 bus, a prayer at church unanswered. As a girl, she blows out the candles, tries so hard. But in the morning, the menthol Newports are still burning. Her sister, Isidra, is making breakfast. An extension cord lays limp as a dead snake on a chair back, just waiting to come to life. Jocelyn's mother is still alive. Palm a kiss on the roof of a car then, racing through a tunnel, eyes closed tight, hands held, a chain of sister, sister, brother, for good luck. We wish that Gladys was dead, but nothing. And now, all those these years later, and yet all of a sudden, she is dead. Her head in an oven, the inevitable snore. The policeman speaks of minutes too late, of next of kin, of only she. I see, Jocelyn says, and grief, surprising and heavy, fills her. It happened, the policeman says, just this morning. Jocelyn is silent, picturing the scene, even from the coast of California, after more than 20 years, it, co it comes clear. The Winton Terrace government housing, the mustard colored stove, mice feces in the cereal cupboards. Cirrhosis makes the stomach bloat. Are you there? The policeman's voice asks, coming through the receiver. But how to answer that? She places the phone down. She walks into her vast living room. She sits and runs a flat hand along the white suede of the couch. She tells the girl she is to begin now, to see the death for what it is, clemency, light. She speaks her sister's name and then her brother's, the names of the dead, like a prayer for strength. Begin, she says, it is safe to begin. She looks at the ocean from her living room, wonders as she often does, how did I get here from there? How can I fit in a place like this? When her husband comes into the room, he asks her what is wrong. My mother is dead, she wants to say, but she is unable to speak. It's something I've always wanted. Her mother's death does not capsize her. Instead, it creates a subtle seeping. She is like a rowboat with a tiny hole. She is able to get dressed most days to make herself clean, but an opening, no matter how small, lets things in. There are glimpses, blurred pictures of history, images she does not want to see, hasn't seen in such a long time. 
The death is not the thing, but instead the narrow window. Her husband catches her taking a toothbrush to the minute stains in the waterworks tile of their brand new bathroom. While he is away at work, she hires men to paint freshly painted walls. He notices, he worries, he tells her it can't happen again. She has to keep it together. We have a child now, he reminds her, Lucy. Yes, she says, I'm okay. But a sound, her child voice, a bag, fills a slit. She tries to shake it away. Do you want to go to the funeral, he asks her. Will that make it better? She stands beside him blinking. The visions that abide around her mother's casket are not good. They are unruly. They are fingers and decomposing flesh, a body lifted out of the earth and stomped on. No, she says, no. At school drop off, her daughter Lucy stares at her as she cries, as if she is some strange creature on exhibition, a fetus in the murky waters of a pickling jar. Jocelyn's face is hot with tears. She avoids her friend Maud. She has a headache from not sleeping. When the car comes to a complete stop, Lucy undoes her seatbelt and hops out of her booster seat. She reaches into the front seat and retrieves the tissue from the luxury car's glove box. She blots both of Jocelyn's eyes gently. She is the little adult ministering to her, although only six years old. Lucy turns to get her unicorn back pack from the car's back seat and then kisses Jocelyn's cheek. Don't be sad, Mama. Papa says everything always gets better. Why are you sad? I don't know, Jocelyn says, because she doesn't. Gladys dead is a good thing. She reaches back to hold her lovely daughter. It is something I've wanted for a long time, but now I just feel sad about it. She does not say, it is making me remember it is making me hear her again. I'm sorry. Um, uh, would you like my goo bear, Lucy asks, pointing to a bedraggled looking stuffed polar bear that she has managed to strap into the seat beside her. He'll be lonely today without me, Mama. He'll help. Lucy hands the bear to Jocelyn. Thank you, Jocelyn says, and runs her fingers through her daughter's wonderful hair, making it neat. I'll pick you up, sweetheart. I would never forget you. Don't you worry, I'll do better. Lucy giggles. I'm not worried, mama. Worried about what? She remembers her pajamas, yellow with the feet cut out. Her family was poor. They were all poor. She didn't know how poor at the time, but she knows that now when she sees her daughter's pajamas, the feet are intact. The pajamas are stacked high in Lucy's walk-in closet. We'll just cut them out then, Gladys would say. They'll last you another year. She tries not to think about it. The voices, the cold floors, his leather shoes. Sometimes she worries that she might not be remembering correctly. Her memory isn't exactly complete. It's as if the girl she used to be is really a different girl with separate memories. She remembers, for example, taking a boy's virginity, but not his name. She remembers having sex with an ecstasy dealer, but not what he looked like. Is that something normal people forget? It was a small room. She knows her own responsibility. She hasn't forgotten that. I am a criminal, she says to the therapist, a Dr. Bruce. Her husband Conrad has made the appointment. Your mother is dead, he reminds her. You, you have to deal with this, a fish hook snagging her back to the past. And inside she wonders, will he be arrested if she tells the therapist? Is there a legal obligation? Is there a statute of limitations? He is an old man now, but something in her is still afraid to put him in jail. I should have said something, she says. Maybe, the therapist says, I should have done something, she repeats, adamant. Her whole body is erect with rage on the plush couch. There is a kind of peace in the hatred she feels for herself. You shouldn't have been put in the position, the therapist says, you were a child. There is a shift in the room like the movement of clouds. The sudden silence is a presence she can feel. She is stunned. It is as if someone has slapped her flat and hard across the face. Without meaning to, she begins to weep. 
She is afraid that she will not be able to stop in time to pick Lucy up from school. You shouldn't have been put in the position. The thought has never crossed her mind. I can prescribe you something, the therapist says, handing her a box of tissues. Your mother's death will take some time to work through. No, Jocelyn says, she will force the window shut. No drugs, I don't believe in antidepressants. It's going to get worse before it gets better. You'll have to do something. Do you exercise? Do you run? Yoga's good, church. Yoga, running, she can't imagine it. Church is laughable. When I was a kid, the minister wanted to fuck me, she wants to say, but this woman is such a stranger. I used to play tennis, she says. I mean, before my daughter was born. The therapist writes something in her book. Why not go back to it? Just try it. You need an outlet, a healthy one. You'll have to come back here once a week, maybe more. Do you understand? I do, Jocelyn says, wiping away her tears. You must go, her husband says. You cannot fall apart, Lucy. Call me if you need to talk, the therapist looks at the clock. Jocelyn stands up, goes to the door. She tries to open it, but it is locked. Panic moves through her. She pulls and pulls on the doorknob. She is in her childhood closet again. The lock clicks, a smoky coat with shoulder pads, the floor that smells like cat pee, the starved cat, all life a thin reed. Her mother had gold platform shoes. The therapist touches her shoulder gently, unlocks the door, quieting her. It's to keep us safe, she says. I don't want anyone coming in here. Keep the crazies out, Jocelyn says, forcing a smile. Exactly. Thank you. We can all unmute and clap. Oh, I just don't think the emoji does what the sound of clapping actually does. <laughs> Not make up for that. Okay, so thank you very much, Robin. That's beautiful. Um, next up, we have Shoba Rao. Shoba is the author of the short story collection *An Unrestored Woman* and the novel *Girls Burn Brighter*. Dick Sebastian in the New York Times wrote of Girls Burn Brighter, the pages keep turning, the language is lyrical and lovely, and many phrases call for pause and appreciation. Garlands of jasmine, plump as pillows, is a kind of image that stays with you. I agree. Shoba is the winner of the Catherine Ann Porter Prize in Fiction. And her story, Kavita and Mustafa, was chosen by T.C. Boyle for inclusion in Best American Short Stories 2015. Girls Burn Brighter was long listed for the Center for Fiction First Novel Prize and was a finalist for the California Book Award. She attended the Community of Writers in 2002, where she said that she received an affirmation that she was indeed a writer, regardless of who questioned it out in the larger world and gave her the encouragement to keep writing. In particular, she worked with Michael Carlyle and met Knopf editor Anne Close here at the Community of Writers. She lives in San Francisco. Um, there's a talk by Shoba that I was talking to her about earlier that I love. And so if, if any of you get a chance, it's free on YouTube. It's called Preserve by Letting Go. Um, and in it, she describes going out to the badlands of South Dakota to write Girls Burn Brighter and gaining strength and inspiration from what she saw out there. And I'm not gonna give it away. So go to, go to YouTube to find that out. It's a, uh, a stunning talk. Her quarantine coping strategy is to write. She says expressing herself on the page, no matter how hard, helps her understand the world. Welcome, Shoba. Thank you. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm so honored to be here, so thank you. Um, and much like Robin uh, said in her opening comments, um, I was actually there at the same time as you, Robin. So I'm sure we met, but 2002 feels like an ancient time, like a, the before times. And so, um, but uh, I too arrived, uh, an innocent, naive, should I say arrogant writer? Um, I had written my first book and much like you, Robin, I thought, okay, well, I'm just gonna go to this conference and I'm gonna, you know, get an agent and it'll get published and done, right? And so I came to the community of writers, um, wide-eyed and 
I want to tell you all about a very specific thing that happened while I was there that I haven't really spoken much about. So bear with me in my telling of it. Um, it was one evening uh, when I think it was, you know, while we were preparing for dinner and I had never really been in the mountains. Um, and so the air was so beautiful and crisp and, you know, almost ethereal. And so I remember I was walking up this sort of hill and as I'm walking up this hill, I see a gentleman, a man sitting, who's also uh, at there for the workshops, um, but I had not spoken to him. I just recognized him from, um, from the, the, the workshops or, you know, maybe walking around. Um, and yet I hadn't spoken to him. And so I, I, we kind of waved to each other and he beckons me over. And so I go and we sit on like this low rock or a bench and we're both just sitting there quietly. And finally he begins to speak. And the way in which he was speaking was so deliberate and so intentional that I was, you know, I was keenly aware of the deliberateness and it was really captivating. And so what he was talking about was having had a stroke very recently. And he couldn't have been very old, maybe late 30s, early 40s. And so he was telling me about having this stroke. And he said, the thing is, he said, I lost my ability to walk. And he said, I lost my ability to speak, which in some ways explained the deliberateness of his, of his, um, of how he was speaking. And he said, I lost my ability to hold a pen, which as you can imagine for us writers, is in itself a kind of death, right? And as he was telling me the story, we were watching all our colleagues and peers, um, you know, sort of setting up for dinner. And he said, you know, once that happens, once you lose those basic abilities, once you're reduced to infanthood, he says, what happens is you learn to not be afraid you learn, you become fearless um, because you have to go back to sort of babyhood and learn the most basic things. He said, I had to learn how to chew, how to swallow. And I listened to him and then I sort of went back down and you know, we didn't really exchange information or anything like that. We just sort of parted. And as I said earlier, that was in 2002 and it took 15 years after that point for um, anything to happen publication wise in my life. Not only did that first book not, got pub not get published of mine, but the uh, next four or five, I've lost count, did not get published, but I kept writing. And I thought about that man and whose name I don't even remember anymore, if I ever knew it. I thought about that man probably hundreds, if not more times in those years. Because, you know, we go to conferences and we think we're gonna like find an agent or we're gonna have our book picked up or we're gonna network and we're gonna, you know, somehow um, come out and, 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 you know, be this sort of part of the literary world. And in fact, what the community of writers gave me and what that man gave me is a fearlessness. So over the years, as those rejections, as those, you know, the, the, the days, the darkness, uh, the, the self-doubts, all of these started piling up over the years. Um, I would think back to that man and I would think, what is there to fear? He gave me courage. The community of writers gave me courage and has seen that courage has seen me through all of these years so i'm so deeply deeply grateful um, for giving me those mountains and those dinners and those workshops and that man who i don't maybe he was a messiah for all i know but he was there and he told me about his journey and that has illuminated my own so um thank you um to the community of writers 
uh, I so uh, am so grateful and, and what an honor to now to be here. So I'm gonna read uh, from the very beginning of my novel as well, um, Girls Burn Brighter. Uh, it's about two girls growing up in a, south, a small South Indian village uh, named Indravalli. And one of the girls, their best friends, one of the girls uh, gets trafficked into the United States and her friend uh, ends up uh, leaving her very difficult marriage and setting out to find this friend who she's not been in touch with for years. Um, and so the novel alternates between their two, uh, their two paths and, and journeys through the world. So I'm gonna read from the very beginning. The most striking thing about the temple near the village of Indravalli was not readily apparent. No one had to first climb the mountain and come close. One had to take a long, thoughtful look at the entrance, at the door, not at its carved panels or its fine graining, but at how the door stood so brave and so luminous and so alone. How it seemed to stand strong and tall as if still a tree. It was the wood lumbered from a grove of trees northwest of Indravalli. The grove was cultivated by an old woman, they said more than a hundred years old, who was childless. She and her husband had been farmers, and when she'd come to understand that she would never have children, she started planting trees as a way to nurture something, as a way to nurture something fragile and lovely. Her husband had surrounded the young saplings with thorny bushes to keep out wild animals. And it being a dry region, she'd had to carry water from many kilometers away to water them. Their grove now boasted hundreds of trees, all of them steady and swaying in the dry wind. A journalist from a local newspaper once went to interview the old woman. He arrived at tea time and he and the old woman sat in the shade of one of the trees. Its wide leaves rustled high above them. They sipped their tea soundlessly. Even the journalist, forgetting all of his questions, was overcome by the quiet, green beauty of the place. He had heard of her childlessness and her recently dead husband. And so, to be delicate, he said, they must keep you company, the trees. The old woman's gray eyes smiled and she said, oh yes, I'm never lonely. I have hundreds of children. The journalist saw an opportunity. He said, so you see them as children? The old woman said, don't you? There was silence. The, the journalist took a long, deep look into the grove of trees, their thick, trunks, their strength, despite drought and disease and insects and floods and famine, and yet shining with gold green light, radiant even in the heat and heaviness of afternoon. You're a fortunate woman, he said, to have so many sons. The old woman looked up at him, her eyes on fire, her wrinkled face taking on the glow of her girlhood. I am fortunate, she said, but you're mistaken, young man. These aren't my sons, not one. These, she said, are my daughters. Thank you. you clap, you can unmute and clap. That was beautiful. Thank you. Gorgeous. Amazing. Thank you. Hey, next up, this is a wonderful night with Marcy Vogel. Um, earlier today, uh, this weekend, Marcy wasn't able to talk to me because she was at the vets. Um, her dog, Chato, needed emergency care and sadly didn't make it through the night. And uh, we lost our dog four years ago. So just reading her text made my heart go out to her. It was so difficult. Um, so we're so glad that she can join us tonight. And I told her it was completely understandable if she would be overcome with emotion at various points. Um, so thank you for being here, Marcy. 
Um, Marcy's quarantine coping strategy is to run at a park near where she lives and she gives people she encounters on her runs a peace sign with her hand as a quick and unintrusive greeting and symbol of solidarity during these times. She's the author of Death and Other Holidays, winner of the Miami Book Fair de Groot Prize for the novella. NPR's Lily Meyer in her review wrote, Death and Other Holidays brilliantly balances humor and anger, sorrow and beauty. Vogel's subjects may be grief and death, but her writing reflects life as we live it, life with its many intricate unnoticed balances. She also wrote At the Border of Wilshire and Nobody, which was the winner of the Howling Bird Press Poetry Prize. Her poetry, prose, translations, and cross-genre inventions appear in Jacket 2, Vita, Seneca Review, Plume, and other publications. A first-generation college student, Vogel earned a PhD in creative writing and literature from the University of Southern California. She currently serves as a Mellon postdoctoral fellow in the humanities. She attended Community of Writers in 2005 and 2017 as the recipient of a Hillary Gravendike Memorial Scholarship. Marcy worked with Brenda Hillman, Forrest Yander, Bob Haas, Gregory Pardlow, Gerald Haslam, and the late James D. Houston. Welcome, Marcy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so I'm just, I'm thrilled to be here and to see everybody. Um, as Jimin said, I, I wasn't sure um, if I, when I started talking finally, if I was just going to burst into tears because I'm just kind of holding it together after the, the loss of my, my dear, my dear friend and companion, Chato. Um, it's, it's been a 12, 12 year, beautiful, beautiful life that he shared with me. So, um, one of the, I'll come back to this, but one of the objects I wanted to share was um, my watch, which I wore on, on Friday, and it was working just fine. It's analog. I don't know if it's upside down for you, but um, uh, I, I I had to rush Chato to the emergency room. Um, he was having a rupture with his eye on Friday night, late Friday night, um, when I went to go give him some medication for his arthritis i saw that his as i did not look good so i bundled him up put him in the car but it was um it was late so um the next day um after talking to the vet um i knew we um had to make a decision um for him that would, would cause us to miss him terribly i went to go get my watch because i just i always just like to have it there and the time had stopped just reminded me of the Auden poem. Um, it's like life just sort of stopping in the midst of it. So um, it actually had the exact time when I noticed Chato's eye um, being um, ulcered. And uh, so it's at 1040 and um, you know, it's, it's, it's my trusty Timex. So at some point I will replace the battery and use it. It's the only watch I, I use, but just to be able to kind of capture it in this time and place. Um, Jim, thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, uh, and then the other, the other thing, um, a watch will, will make an appearance actually in the reading too. So, um, and another object that will make an appearance um, is, is a rose. And um, I have some rose bushes on the side of the house. And um, this one actually uh, started to bud yesterday. And I don't know if you can see it, um, but it's, it's just very red right here. And so I was walking by where Chato usually goes on the yard and I just, there was only one rose starting to bud and this was it and this was it um, today, what it looked like. So, um, and there's a rose that also figures in the reading. So, um, Jim mentioned that um, uh, I attended the um, the community of writers um, uh, by the gracious gifts um, given to support um, the Hillary Gravendike Memorial Scholarship. And I never got to meet Hillary, but she was a big hero for me. She had a series of commentaries or, or it's like a roundtable discussion in Jacket 2 about the poet scholar. 
And um, I was sharing with Jimin as well that I had never thought of myself as a poet. I didn't have any training in poetry. Um, you know, even that I went to college um, was, you know, a big surprise and, and uh, privilege. But um, I loved seeing Hilary Gravendike's uh, commentaries on the poet scholar, and it just made me understand poetry is a way of knowing something and um and i wouldn't have been able to uh, to attend um as a poet to the community of writers so i just i wanted to share a poem um, from her book harm um, published by the wonderful omnidon beautiful independent press here in california that we all love i think <laughs> um, and this poem is called botanica it's in a series of poems in the book called botanica Grass in flat whirls show you bedding down in the wind. The rocks chalked with mineral lines. The monstrous plant life. Imagine a carriage wheel turning on sand. Crest of every rise on fire. The aspen flicking its wrist. I'm a line of apprentice observers, a field of insistent grass seeds loosed from the stalk. Above the smoked glass of the sky, there's atmosphere. Underneath you, a cache of white shells. All the small scents close in the air. Coyote, mint, sage, dust. Softly, the dimmed hillside. I'm streaming away from you. The sound water makes when it runs through leaves. That's Hilary Gravendike's work. Um, okay. Uh, the book, um, Death and Other Holidays, it has, it has a, a kind of a long story, as, as many of our stories do um, seem to have a, a sense of endurance to them. Um, and so this, this one, um, you know, I've written since I was a girl, but just that I would grow up to become a writer was just inconceivable. Nobody in my family wrote. The books I checked out from the library each week seemed just a kind of magic, not something that I might ever make myself. Um, but then I was thinking maybe writing is something you do, not something you are. And no matter what else I was doing or was, I always wrote. Um, so sometime in the last century, I was working my first real job, taking a creative writing class at night at Santa Monica College. Um, in the middle of the spring semester, my beloved stepfather died. And because the loss felt too tender to talk about, uh, I wrote some tiny stories instead. Um, I'll read a few of those to you. From Death and Other Holidays. Now, I found this old camera when we were clearing out Wilson's dresser drawers, and I'm going to start taking pictures. Libby says I'm gonna drive her crazy with all the snap, snap, snapping every two seconds. But I read about this woman in the newspaper. She said she's afraid of losing her mind, her memory of being erased. So every day she takes a photograph of something and that way she won't lose her life when the time comes. I thought it was a good idea. Green. They say winter is the season of death, but anyone I've ever known who's died, they died in the spring. They say you're supposed to get this miraculous sense of renewal and promise, but it never happens that way either. Libby says it's because we live in Los Angeles and our seasonal clocks are set by new lipstick colors. But I don't think that's it. Maybe the changes aren't as obvious as in colder climates. The spring is spring, and it always feels kind of precarious. I mean, there's so much upheaval, all those blossoms forcing their way out of winter branches, tiny sprouts trying to break through the dirt. The whole business just seems a colossal effort, and if you don't have a pretty good reason for it, well, I guess I can understand why the entire scheme might not be worth another round. 
Consider, for example, my father. He couldn't stand it, not one more spring. He hanged himself the year I turned 16. He left me his Datsun B210 hatchback, and it was months before I learned to operate the clutch without stalling. And my mother's mother, she held on all winter after a stroke. Halfway through March, she had enough. She made sure my mother knew how to cook a decent brisk holiday brisket, then died in her sleep. And now Wilson, my mother's second husband, Wilson, he died last week. I thought maybe he'd live forever, and maybe he would have if we had insisted on staying past visiting hours. He was so polite, he'd never die with us there. My mother called early Sunday though, told me to meet her by the nurse's station. She took down all the good well, the get well cards, tossed the dried up flowers, his green striped pajamas, the slippers I got him last Father's Day. It was all done. Hey there, beauty, baby girl, he'd said. Wilson's life is over. Yours is just beginning. He was pumped full of morphine and he wrote me this note, start, go. It was spring and I knew he was right. I just didn't feel up to it, was all. Heartbreak. It was the first new dress that Wilson wouldn't see, black with tiny white polka dots. My husband died yesterday, my mother told the saleswoman as she rang up our purchase. The first time my mother and Wilson saw each other was in that elegant Hollywood apartment, the one he shared with Leo Fine. They tell me I was busy crawling up the stairs one New Year's Eve when my mother shouted to Wilson, don't step on my baby. I was seven when they got married. I never asked what happened in between. Every spring, my mother and I would go shopping. We'd come home and take turns modeling new clothes, hats, shoes. My mother liked the skirts that twirled. She'd spin around and Wilson would clap his hands and say, out of my mind over it, best skirt in the world. He'd have the Lakers on TV with the volume turned off. And if they missed a shot while we were changing in the next room, I'd know because I could hear his voice. Heartbreak, he'd say to no one in particular. So my instructor at Santa Monica College, Jim Crusoe, who I think you might know from, um, from the Santa Monica Review, uh, is a beloved writer um, of many of us. The tiny stories, they grew into a stack of pages and Jim told me just keep writing. Um, they didn't really look like any pages I'd ever read. I tried mailing some of them out. Yes, I used snail mail. People wrote back the kindest rejections, but nobody seemed to know what to do with a stack of uh, tiny stories. <laughs> um, so I put them in a drawer and uh, years passed and, and then a century. I wrote another stack of pages and this time of poems that became a collection and that's also due to the community of writers and one of my housemates who told me when I was there in prose, Marcy, I think you're actually a poet and I, I it took me much by surprise, <laughs> um, but she was right. Um, anyway, more years passed and last, uh, well, actually a, a couple of years ago, the book came out in 2018, the tiny stories in the drawer started knocking. So I took a few of them out and I sent them via submittable this time to a journal I long admired, Quarter After Eight. Um, and uh, around the same time, uh, another friend, um, uh, this is just the community in the community of writers, she told me about um, uh, um, a listserv created by poet Alison Joseph, who many of you know, she's just a very generous literary citizen. And so, um, I, uh, I sent the entire stack of stories and I guess all the stars aligned this time because the little book of my heart, it, it finally arrived in, in full bloom. And um, I'm just gonna read to you um, uh, a, rose, a rose piece from it called Harvest. I don't know why I thought it could grow anything. 
but it seemed worth a go. Victor told me I could sign up for a plot in the community garden down the street from my new apartment. It has a great view. You can see all the way to the ocean. I went to the nursery and bought all kinds of stuff. Gloves, seeds, fertilizer, an assortment of shovels and rakes. I put it all in the trunk of my car. Victor and I took to walking over in the evenings after dinner. The first time we went, Victor tore out all the weeds with his bare hands while I watched the sun go down. After that, it became our regular Friday night date. We kept a couple of aluminum and nylon web folding chairs there. We'd sit them in the dirt, watch the pink sky, the glassy ocean. The Friday after Thanksgiving, we actually drove over. We took all the gear out of the car, turned over the dirt and emptied a bag of soil grow, soil grow into the ground. The woman in the next plot told us it wasn't really the season to start a garden, not tomatoes anyway. I looked up early winter planting in a book I got from the library, Sunset Easy Guide to Vegetable Gardens. It said lettuce and certain kinds of beans. This is California, Victor said, plant whatever you want. I bought seeds for lettuce, zucchini, and green beans and drove them over to the garden. I followed the directions on the back of the seed packets, planted the zucchini in two lopsided circles, the beans in a small grid. They would need watering more than every Friday. It's best to come in the early morning or evening, the woman in the next plot told me. If you're going to be here in the afternoons, you'll need a hat. Yeah. Okay, I said, thanks. About every two days, I drove over to the garden after work, put on my blue denim hat and watered the dirt. By the next Friday, the beans had sprouted. I showed Victor. Beans put in the ground will do that, he said. In another week or so, the zucchini plants poked up and the beans were ready to pick. I cooked them that evening for dinner. We each got 12 beans. Later, we walked over to the garden to see the bright orange flowers on the zucchini plants. It was getting dark early now and the petals glowed like huge orange bugs in the twilight. The next week, I had a big project at work. And by the following Friday, everything had wilted from no water. I was miserable with failure. Victor kissed me, held my hand all the way back to the apartment. The next day, I got the yearly Jewish New Year's letter from Esther and Saul, elderly cousins of my father's. Three months late, the letter had been forwarded to my new place. It was written all in capital letters. What is going on in our garden? Things are not going too well. We had some cabbage, but it tasted bitter. The tomato plant started out very good, but by the time the fruit came, the plants wilted, so it could have been the heat or a fungus in the soil. The fig tree is doing very well, except the green figs that are supposed to taste sweet are not. We always have a rose on our dining room table. I think I'm going to have to wait on the watch piece. Thank you so much. And um, also, um, this is the pandemic baby from France. <laughs> the French translation. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Love to see different type of covers. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. And, you know, I love hearing these stories about just persevering, right? Mm -hmm just kept those in the drawer and then they found their way out again. That's beautiful. Um, so everyone who at home has got a project in the drawer or is writing something, just hold on to it because there may be life after and there's always a reader out there. Um, so next we have Alia Wolf. Um, she's the author of Home Baked, my Mom, Marijuana, and the Stoning of San Francisco. It's been called a sometimes sad yet stirring love letter to San Francisco, filled with profundity and pride by Kirkus Reviews. And it's already been optioned by J.J. Abrams' Bad Robot production company. 
So it will be coming to the screen sometime soon. Um, additionally, well, uh, Alia's work has appeared in Best American Essays. I'm telling you, this group tonight is amazing. So many accomplishments. The New York Times, Bon Appetit, Guernica, The Three Penny Review, and many other publications. Her unusual family story has been featured on Snap Judgment and NPR's Fresh Air. She's grateful. Sorry, what you hear is my dog slurping water over here. She's grateful to have received the Oakley Hall Memorial Scholarship in 2011 and the Oakley Tad Hall Pro Scholarship in 2014. Alia recalls Louis B. Jones as particularly encouraging voice during her time at the Community of Writers. She's received fellowships from the McDowell Colony and UCross Foundation. She says that during this time of COVID, it's writing that gets her out of bed in the morning, eager to tap that creative vein and work on her next book, which is related to family and generations. Um, we got a chance to talk about it a bit and it's a riveting, unusual story and you can't wait to read it. You're all in for a treat when she's done with that. Welcome, Alia. Thank you so much, uh, Jamin, and I've really enjoyed all of these readings. It's so beautiful, and I feel like it's a wonder that we don't all know each other. The community of writers feels so small, and yet I don't know any of you uh, who I'm reading with tonight. I, I remember coming to the community of writers for the first time in 2011 and going to the alumni reading, and I thought it was just the most glamorous thing in, in the world. <laughs> and uh, like, like everyone else, it has taken me a decade uh, or more than a decade to move from that place to this place. It takes the time it takes. Uh, and, and, and my book, Home Baked, spent a good solid six, seven years in the drawer at a point when I didn't know what to do with it. Um, so, you know, sometimes there's a lot of growing that has to do in between that first, having that first idea and doing the, the initial work and really being able to give it the shape that it that the work needs um, and to and to honor that and so it's so it's so particularly wonderful to have this community that even though I haven't been to one of the workshops in several years I still feel like part of the family and and I'm all eternally grateful to the extended Hall family for early support like before I knew that I had any anything really you know I thought I enjoy writing but. Do I have it? And I and I and I felt so encouraged that first time. Um, and it and it helps you like it gets you to go back to the roulette wheel again and again. I don't know if that's a good thing, really, because writing is kind of a crazy thing to do for a living. Uh, it takes so long to bear fruit, but um, it's just extraordinary to feel like part of this community. So I, I just thank thank you so much to all of you. Um, okay, so. Homebaked is, is nonfiction. I think I might be the only nonfiction person here today. Um, my folks, uh, and especially my mom, who's here with us tonight, was a pioneer in the medical marijuana industry. And so this book follows Sticky Fingers Brownies from the 19, mad, like disco mad 1970s party days in San Francisco, when it was really like frothy politics and a lot of crazy stuff going on through the AIDS crisis into the dawn of medical marijuana. Um, a, a, lot of, a lot of people see my topic and maybe the cover is a little bit, it's cheerful, right? It's a cheerful cover and think that this is going to be a comedy, like a Cheech and Chong kind of thing. And, and so to disabuse all of you of that, I'm gonna read something really depressing tonight. Uh, I think I'm, just, I'm just in the mood to bum everyone out. So, you know, deal with it. So this comes from fairly late in the book. I'm also going to do a thing which I, I enjoy doing when I read since we are all in the Zoom world. We're seeing so many talking heads all the time. I'm gonna share a little slideshow. Um, it might be a little out of step with what I'm reading because the slideshow is mostly from the more exuberant 70s period and I'm going to read you something from the more depressing AIDS period. Um, but I thought it would be nice to give you something to look at besides my head. And uh, so let's see if we can do this. And we'll do it as a slideshow. All right. I think everyone's got a slideshow going. Cool. And uh, what, I'm, what I'm reading is from really the latter part of the book. 
and uh, as I say, it's depressing as, as hell. So enjoy. <laughs> wait, 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 Alia, we're, oh, we're, what I'm seeing is, um, are you going to start this slideshow? What, what no, I'm seeing is- I'm not getting the slideshow. I'm sorry. Thank you for telling me. Oh, it's okay. Again. Uh, here we go. Okay. Uh, Great. Now it's working. Is it? Or is that just- Are you seeing a slideshow or are you just seeing one picture? Oh, one picture. My goodness. Sorry. Okay. Let me try this one more time. So the screen sharing is paused. Uh, if this doesn't immediately work, I'm just going to can it. Um, but let's let's see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. There you go. Um, so this is the the sticky fingers crew in the '70s. While I read you a depressing scene from 1987. During recess, a popular kid named Jerry called another kid a fag. There's nothing wrong with being gay, I said. So Jerry ran around the tetherball court screaming that I had AIDS and was trying to give it to him. Other kids joined in, including the one Jerry had called a fag in the first place. Several of my mom's friends were battling AIDS. We talked about it often at home. So I knew you couldn't catch it like a cold or flu. Jerry was an idiot, but that didn't make it less embarrassing. My mom had operated an underground marijuana brownie business since before I was born. She used to pack my stroller with brownies and wheel me through the Castro to make deliveries. Many of her customers became close family friends. At night, they'd come over to our house for brownies and conversation. Sean, who had spiky platinum blonde hair and pierced eyebrows, was wickedly funny. He nicknamed me Womb Unit, Woomy for short, because he'd known my mom since she was pregnant. There was Barry, the cabaret crooner, and Gino, the salsa DJ with his snappy tropical style. There was my mom's best friend, Philip, whose laugh began deep in his chest and ended with a Twitter. When mom picked me up after school, I told her about the incident with Jerry and the other kids. What a bunch of ignoramuses, she said. It'll get better, I promise. Ugh, when? Probably college. I'm nine. Time flies, she said. We have to make a couple of deliveries. Whatever. I opened my window to damp, to, I'm sorry. I opened the car window to damp air that smelled like a salt lick. Sweatshirt weather, hometown weather. Mom was melting pounds away on the Oprah Winfrey fast. She lined her blue, green, amber eyes with coal and purple eyeshadow, wore heavy, heavy silver jewelry, and had burgundy tinted hair with an asymmetrical cut like Sheila E. Slo uh, she slung wide leather belts with giant flying saucer handles. Uh, buckles low around her hips and saw the necks sawed the necks out of her shirts to show off her shoulders. She liked to stand out, but I wanted nothing more than to blend in. I wore black leggings, keds, and bulky sweatshirts like the other kids. Once a classmate invited me to play Super Mario Brothers after school, I remember being amazed by how sterile her apartment seemed. Everything tidy and beige, no art anywhere. Her mom brought us snacks on a tray like in a sitcom. I tried to act normal, but the weirdness must have leaked out somehow. The girl's mom later told her we couldn't be friends. I didn't ask why. I felt like a creature from another planet. Our battered, battered Corolla wheezed up a steep side street deep in the Castro. You could see all, all the way to downtown from where we parked. Come in, mom asked. Who lives here? New customers, she said, friends of Sylvester's. That settled it. Sylvester was a big black flamboyant disco diva who had the most extraordinary three-story house cluttered with antiques, weird art, and lush fabric, even a pool table. There was always a crowd of guys cracking jokes, showing off for one another, while Sylvester held court from his divan. 
Sylvester had been buying my mom's marijuana brownies since I was in the stroller, and I loved tagging along. In that world, weird was a plus. If these were Sylvester's friends, I wanted to meet them. Mom opened the trunk to load her purse with brownies, and the rich, earthy scent rose through the ocean wind. I'd helped her bake them over the weekend. We crossed to a wedding cake Victorian with scroll work along the roof and gravity defying bay windows projecting from the facade. When mom rang the bell, the door unlatched by itself and swung open, controlled by an old fashioned automatic butler. Inside was a narrow flight of interior stairs. A man's voice called, come on up dear. He stood on the landing, backlit by alcove windows. When my eyes adjusted, my breath snagged. He was shirtless, chest sunken, chest sunken like he'd been hit by a flying bowling ball. His sweatpants hung from protruding hip bones. Purple lesions dappled his chest and neck. Up near his collarbone, sores had grown together into a large butterfly. I'd seen Kaposi sarcoma before. Some of my mom's friends had it, but not like this. I remember feeling embarrassed, not by his scant clothing, but by his scant flesh. He seemed startled to see a kid. Forgive me for not dressing up. Fashion's the first thing to go. That's okay, sweetie, my mom said. I'm a pajamas around the house girl too. This is my daughter, Alia. Then she added, don't worry, she's cool. Alia, what a unique name, he said. I wish my parents had come up with something more exotic than David. It's so pedestrian, Ashante. When David turned to lead us toward the living room, my mom locked eyes with me, her expression a little frantic. There were, I'm sorry, then we were, in a large overheated room with gleaming hardwood floors and soaring ceilings. Sylvester raves about your brownies, David said. Food has gotten so blech. Dessert first, my mom said brightly, guaranteed munchies. Near a pretty bay window, a hospital bed was cocked to a half seated position. It appeared empty until I realized that the small gray tangle of blankets was a person. Eyes closed, cheeks so paper thin that I could make out his teeth. Pale blonde hair fanned behind his shoulders. Even at nine, I knew he was dying. Keith, honey, wake up for a sec, David said. I want you to meet someone. An IV bag dangled from a hook above the bed, and my eyes followed the yellowish snake of tubing to Keith's hand, the bruising around the needle, the bulge of his wrist bones. One finger twitched. He murmured, what's that baby? David leaned close to his lover's lips. He placed his palm gently on Keith's cheek. Another murmur. Okay, okay, in a minute, I'm getting us those magic brownies. David faced us with a smile that wasn't a smile. He's having a bad day. While they did the deal, I wandered around the room. A framed photograph sat on the mantel, two men shirtless on a beach, arms slung around each other. One looked like Tom Selleck without the chest fur and the other had beachy surfer hair and bright blue eyes. Both were tanned and muscular, shoulders flecked with sand. I began to sweat. Now, don't eat too much, my mom was saying. Start with a quarter of a brownie and give that 45 minutes before taking more. I'm serious, they'll have to pull you off the ceiling. More like the floor, David said with a rich laugh. The contours of his, of his face softened. His teeth gleamed white. For a moment, he was handsome, almost Tom Selleck. That radiance was the worst part. In the car afterward, my mom put her hands on the steering wheel, but didn't start the engine. 
Wow, she said. You okay? Sure, I lied. I wouldn't have brought you in. She put her clammy hand over mine. Her chin trembled and collapsed. I didn't want to watch her cry, so I focused on the rooftop scattered below us like jigsaw puzzle pieces in a box top. You could see all the way to downtown, the Transamerica Pyramid rising above the stubby skyline, the Gray Bay Bridge loping across the water to Oakland. As we descended the hill, a van bearing the logo of Project Open Hand, a, ch a charity that delivered hot food to sick people, was heading up. Would you look at that, my mom said. They're bringing the food and we're bringing the medicine to help the food stay down. I felt her eyes on me. You know we're helping these guys, right? At school, the fourth grade was learning how to just say no to drugs. The program was called Drug Abuse Resistance Education, but we all called it DARE to keep kids off drugs. The slogan emblazoned on bookmarks, notebooks, and t-shirts. In the cafeteria twice per week, a uniformed cop lectured us about the dangers of illegal narcotics like marijuana, about how to handle peer pressure and how to rec recognize and report dealers. I was careful to give the right answers. My mom kept giant garbage bags of marijuana crammed in the closet in our spare bedroom. She had been operating a massive illegal weed business so for years before AIDS came along, we were the people the cops warned my class about. But I knew we were the good guys, even if it meant lying to police, teachers, other kids, everyone really. The next day, I'd be back at school with Jerry and the other ignoramuses, and I would never let a word escape about what I'd seen in that home in the Castro, the enormity of it. I knew how to keep a secret. My mom became more wary of taking me on deliveries after that, concerned that I'd be traumatized. I never saw David or Keith again. When I ask my mom about them now, she tells me she delivered a couple more times below, I'm sorry. She tells me she delivered a couple more times before their phone was disconnected, meaning they were dead. And within a year, Sylvester himself was gone, along with the whole vibrant scene that surrounded him. Thank you. And the pressing story. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you, Alia. Thank you. Um, so, I, it, Kate, Kate Weisel, um, are you back, Kate? I think she had a couple of connection problems. Um, I wasn't able to see the chat, so. Um, I'm here. Oh, yay, okay, good. Yeah. Okay, terrific, thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Alia. And those, the, the, those photographs were amazing. It really, um, it was great. And then all the details of what you read. Amazing. So thank you for reading that, for choosing that. Um, so fantastic. Kate Wiesel is the author of Driving in Cars with Homeless Men. It's the winner of the 2019 Drew Hines Literature Prize, which was selected by Ninjin Lee. Ninjin is amazing work as well. In a review in Split Lip Magazine, D. Arthur wrote, while Wiesel's stories have grit and gravitas, they also leave room for buoyancy and joy. Her fiction has appeared in such publications as Gulf Coast, Tin House Online, New Delta Review, The Best Small Fictions 2019, Red DeVeter as winner of the Beacon Street Prize and elsewhere. She was a Carol Huck Fiction Fellow at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and awarded scholarships at Writing by Writers, the Wesleyan Writers Conference, the Community of Writers at Valley. She attended in 2016 with the Carlisle Family Scholarship and worked with Kirsten Valdez Quaid. She's a native of Boston and lives in Chicago where she teaches at Columbia College Chicago and Loyola University. Kate says 
And this is her, um, not only her quarantine coping strategy, but her strategy of all time is to swing. She's an avid swinger. And what she means by that is playground <laughs> swings. She swings almost every day on a playground swing, listening to music, and uses that time to think about her writing. Welcome, Kate. So glad you're back. Thank you so much. I'm so glad I'm back too, right? Um, I Thank you so much, Jermaine. It was so, so nice of you to um, talk with each of us before this reading, and I think it really goes in line with the kindness and the generosity um, that existed and exists um, still throughout my life, and obviously there were lives of so many other writers. So thank you, Brett and Lisa. Um, I have been to quite a few um, writing conferences and sometimes I have to admit, I, it feels a little bit like summer camp for freshman year dorm type situation and I'm, I feel a little nervous and I'll never forget how welcoming the community was. And I now have lifelong friends that I met um, when I was a scholarship student. And I'm just so grateful for your ongoing support. So I'll be really quick. Um, I'm going to read a flash piece um, from my book and it's broken up into um, not four sections, but there are four characters. So I'm going to read from um, Serena's point of view. I'm exaggerating. Serena wore a navy two-piece suit, sensible flats, twisted up hair, a button collar over the wrist, red faded blah, 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 blah script. Her first flight was to Wichita and she had asked Nico if he knew what Wichita looked like from the sky. She wanted to hurt him, for him to picture her cloud height off the ground, 1600 miles to the middle, untouchable. She scooped ice and twisted bottle caps, balanced her palms on headrests during dips, the aisle a tight rope. It rattled, the overheads, the ice, her fingers. Sometimes the pilot and the co-pilot looks like the cops who rapped on her door the month before. In the cockpit, their hands on the gears against the bright, complicated look of the control panel. The backs of their heads against the bright, complicated look of the sky. She cracked the front door, chain off the bolt, swollen eye. Her smile across, index finger against her lip. Nico was passed out in boxers in the bedroom in a deep sleep. The cops pushed through, ignored her. I made a mistake, she said. She paced, the blood in her hair graffiti orange and stiff. Blood on the white table, sprays of droplets from huffs where her mucus went loose under the break. I'm exaggerating, she told the cops, then recognized it as something he would tell her, right in her ear like a basketball coach fighting the sideline. Get up, Nico would say. You're faking all of this. Wichita was not what she thought. Little Rock, Providence. Nowhere she'd been or belonged, but all familiar. She had a day off in Spokane. Bumpy wheels of luggage by her heel, she roamed down Division Street, smokestacks filling with filth up towards an ocean-colored mountain. Janice Joplin on a brick wall, fingers outstretched. Towards the river, the smell of spoiled milk in a sign, near nature, near perfect. Pine trees that could see inside homes and for miles. Back on the plane, she found passengers to their rows. Locked in the Clorox blue of the bathroom, she fingered her new insignia, a wing pin she wore like a crucifix into sleep. And on the dark seat, facing backward, going forward, she thought of what to do. This she thought of terminally. What was down there, what wasn't. There was no losing of a baby or liters of liquor and desk drawers. She had enough money to run up a credit card. There was a lease, the stain of their signatures, one under the other, hers under his, as if he could hold her down with ink. Somewhere above Lake Superior, she heard an infant's cry. It was a salt water gargle, as disturbing and rangy as a vocal warm up. She walked down the aisle, mirroring the sound, and found a mother dozing in a seat. She lifted the infant from the mother's sleeping arms, 
Her t-shirt was splotched with milk at the nipples, her slump vaguely sexual, like she'd been slipped a Mickey. Serena strode the aisle with the infant in her arms, its wail an emergency. It filled the cabin with an engine-like force, though those fat ringed thighs kicking against her stomach went nowhere. She watched as a businessman's eyes popped open. She gazed at them, felt his shock upon waking, mid-air, mid-shriek. She pawned the little one's wet head, the mask of a soft, wet scalp under her eyes, the seam of her lips by an ear the size of a bottle cap. She whispered, hey there. She whispered, don't be quiet. She whispered, keep screaming. Thank you so much. I'd like to hear some hands. <laughs> all of these wonderful writers. Um, thank you, Kate, that was beautiful. And thank you all for showing up and supporting writing and the community of writers. If you're able, um, please go to bookshop.org and order the books by all of these writers tonight. Um, they all have amazing websites. I've been to all of them, they're beautiful. So you can find out more about them as well. And um, and please donate to the community of writers if you can. You can see clearly how many won grants and scholarships, um, how many years it took and how every little bit counts. Even if you think like, oh, well, what am I gonna do? I can only donate $20 or whatever it is. Anything helps, it all adds up and um, is really appreciated right now. Um, so thank you. Um, any last minute comments? If there's anything that you'd like to, to talk about, um, we'll be here for a few minutes. And um, I, it's just been a pleasure. Thank you all so much. Thank you again, Brett and Lisa and everyone, community of writers. It's Thank really you, Jen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, I, Thank you so I, much. I, yeah, I have a few words to say. Um, and I just want to say, I, I don't know about any of you, but I am so glad that I was here tonight to listen to our readers and I just want to thank them so much. It was so good to hear the names of, of beloved teachers and friends, Jim Houston, Jim Crusoe, Hilary Gravendick and so many others. And yes, the man who returned to the valley after his stroke in 2002, I just want you all to know that he returned this year again. Oh, wow. Oh my gosh. He is still writing. He is still with us. He is a member of the community. It means so much to hear what, what you all care about and how you care about each other. I, I can't tell you. Um, so thank you so much for being here tonight with us. Um, a few words, a few more words of thanks um, to Jamin for emceeing the event with such heart and making this evening so, so special. Thank you. Oh, so, like so, so Howard and Eva Mellis who um, helped make it happen and to Brett Hall Jones who makes it all happen. <laughs> Gratitude to our wonderful board of directors, um, friends and donors who have sustained us for over 50 years. Right, we have reached our middle age, folks. Um, thanks for, for helping us do that. In addition, um, we'd also like to thank the Academy of American Poets Literary Arts Emergency Fund, the Placer County Arts Council, the Tahoe Truckee Community Foundation, Inkwell Management Literary Agency, the Lojo Foundation, the San Francisco Foundation, and the Ann and Gordon Getty Foundation, friends through the decades who have sustained us. Um, but we are also sustained through the generosity of so many others, literary citizens, people like you who find their way to a place like this, even when it's virtual, drawn by words and stories and the knowledge that when we listen to each other, when we read to each other, when we write our truth, we change the world in ways that is so needed. Thank you. We hope to see you in the high Sierra soon. Stay safe, yeah. vote. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. I miss you all. I miss you all.
I know. It's, you know I miss you all. I wish I was reminding you about sunscreen and staying hydrated and not hiking alone. <laughs> I, I, I just want to say I'm, I'm very good at that kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> we're far apart, um, but as I reminded folks in our virtual um, valley this summer, please go out and look at the stars wherever you are. It's the same sky. It's the same stars. We are here together. Thank you so much. It means